now I'm beginning to understand that in our comedy team writing career, writing jokes for the former You're about to say something so hurtful. You're about to say something so hurtful. I feel like you needed me. I feel like you needed me a little bit. You did need you. (laughs) When we worked on the White House Correspondents' Dinner speeches for President Obama, uh, Judd and I would get on the phone and we would write jokes. But uh, Judd was responsible for some of the funniest jokes that we ever wrote for President Obama, including uh, a big hand in the jokes we wrote for the 2011 Correspondents' Dinner uh, when Trump attended and was destroyed forever and we never heard from him again. Here's what I remember of that time. I was visiting the White House with my family. And as I was walking through, uh, you came out of uh, the Oval Office and, and you said hello. And you said, we're in there right now with the president writing jokes for the correspondence dinner, which I was in town to watch. And I thought that you would invite me in because I am in comedy. And I, mm-hmm. that would make you look good that you pulled me in to help. And I, in my mind, even in that split second, I thought, I'm about to spend an hour with the president. That's how far ahead my mind got. You sent me on my way, and I was <laughs> quietly furious, uh, and I felt like you were afraid to have that kind of power in the room, that I might show off in some way and make everyone look bad due to my acumen. Mm-hmm. So then I bump into you later in the night. Now your speech, I, it was the biggest laugh I'd ever heard in my entire life. Uh, Barack Obama is a master joke teller in a way that I don't know if people can fully fathom. So then drunkenly, I yelled at you at the party and said, how mm-hmm. dare you not let me in that room? And then the next year you remembered and sent me the speech and said, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, and I said, I think you're a little light on your Trump jokes. This is was at the beginning of birtherism and I, explained how much I disliked the man. And I said, I think you should go hard at him. Do you remember that? Like, Yes, I do. I remember being on the phone. I remember our conversation. I remember where I was sitting. I also like, you know, uh, John uh, Favreau was sitting. You called You called right as we were going over the speech and then you got on the phone and that's when you started riffing about The Apprentice and that's when we started writing that section. Yeah, so we discussed that it would be funny for uh, the president to describe in insane detail an entire episode of The Apprentice uh, and then, you know, make a, a flippant remark about how qualified Donald Trump was. And, and, and you and uh, the staff came up with an amazing version that was about Omaha Steaks and referenced all the different people. And, and you told me you didn't think that the president would go for it because it was kind of a conceptual bit. It wasn't a, a one-liner. And you were thrilled when he decided to do it. We all know about your credentials and breadth of experience. Um, For example, uh, no, seriously, just recently, in an episode of Celebrity Apprentice, at the steakhouse, the men's cooking team uh, did not impress the judges from Omaha Steaks. And there was a lot of blame to go around, but you, Mr. Trump, recognized that the real problem was a lack of leadership. And so ultimately, you didn't blame Little John or Meatloaf. <laughs> you fired Gary Busey. And these are the kind of decisions that would keep me up at night. And uh, of course, many people have said, is that why Donald Trump ran for president? And I don't believe that's the case at all. I mean, he had been dancing around it for a long time. And I, I think he's had plenty of days of humiliation and plenty of days of wanting power. I don't think that was the defining moment of his life. But, um, and then I got a, a, a photograph from the president that you got for me. <laughs> and on it, uh, he wrote to Judd, uh, thanks for the jokes, you should get a job in comedy, which I assume you wrote, uh, but still good, still, still good to have. Although now in, in history, I don't know if I should hang it up. I don't we know. Don't want to talk. We don't talk about it that much. We don't need to we talk, don't talk about, about it too much. I, I blame Seth Meyers. I feel like his jokes were way meaner. And then people kind of conflated that with our jokes, which were a little tough. But Seth Meyers annihilated him. They eviscerated were rough him. Jokes. Eviscerated. They were so hard. They were good. They were great. <laughs> and then, of course, there's Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been saying that he will run for president as a Republican, which is surprising since I just assumed he was running as a joke. <laughs> 
I will say, Judd, just so you know, and I've said this, I said this when we told this story on stage. In the moment, I all of a sudden had all of this social awkward anxiety because I felt like we should bring you in, but I also felt like it wasn't my job. I wasn't in charge of me. I'm not the idea of me changing the manifest for a meeting with the president (laughs) suddenly filled me with such a sense of panic and dread that I just like waved at you and wanted the whole thing to go away. Uh, But it ended up it ended up in a in a great in a great pairing and a working relationship for years of writing those jokes. I've forgiven you, and uh, I also believe I was not needed. That became very clear when I saw the speech. It was uh, remarkable. And let me tell you my other proud moment with you, which is I had one joke, uh, the Mitch McConnell joke. Some folks still don't don't think I spent enough time with Congress. Why don't you get a drink with Mitch McConnell, they ask. Really? (laughs) Why don't you get a drink with Mitch McConnell? That was my favorite thing from our conversations. Uh, People say I should spend more time with Republicans. They say, why do you get a drink with Mitch McConnell? (laughs) You get a drink with Mitch McConnell. I remember that now. I I like that too because it was there was it, it both that and the Trump joke. They're not jokes. They're just they're just fun. They're just statements of fact. And it actually approaches the it, that joke approaches the Norm Macdonald platonic ideal of the setup and the punchline being the same. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I you get you get you get a drink with Mitch McConnell. You get a drink with Mitch McConnell. That is yes, I like I love that. I love that. They're so similar. All right, that was so fun. What a trip down memory lane. That was a nice trip down memory lane. And uh, but do you feel in retrospect, w- w- what do you actually feel about that night? Like, do you have an opinion about Trump watching that? I was talking to a friend recently who was one table away and just watched. Trump, uh, you know, red faced watching it. But I do feel like in many spaces, people go hard at him. I, Roasts I, and different. Of course. Places. I also think it's beside the point. My actual view is like, whatever his motivations, it doesn't matter. What happened was that our system was so fucking just, just broken and media was so broken and politics was so broken that this guy was able to sneak in. That's my actual. Yeah. Well, he view. certainly deserved to be mocked. And I think the point of the joke was we don't really want somebody who is just the host of The Apprentice and who's gone bankrupt many times to run the free world. And I think now when you see the result of it, that was on some level what I think we all sense. Like this is a disaster in a way that uh, will be inevitable if he actually is in charge of the levers of power. Yeah, I mean, I think to say it simply, the problem... Uh, with uh, Donald Trump becoming president is not that Barack Obama and Seth Meyers told the truth. It was that not enough other people over the yeah. year and a half and two years that followed, or yes, over the next four years, uh, told the truth themselves. Anyway. Anyway.